Make sure you never miss an FX Medicine episode by subscribing to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts and Spotify. You can also follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram. Welcome to FX Medicine, bringing you the latest in evidence-based, integrative, functional and complementary medicine. I'm Dr. Michelle Woolhouse. FX Medicine acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia where we live and work and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to the elders, past and present, and extend this respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. Today we're going to explore the complex but very important syndrome called mast cell activation syndrome, or MCAS for short, and how by breaking it down into simple constructs can help us as practitioners navigate patients through this windy road back to health. We're also going to look at the whole system's approach to healing and by using basic principles that help us manage the overwhelm faced by both patients and practitioners alike. Joining us on the line today is Beth O'Hara. Beth is a US-based functional naturopath and functional genetic analyst. She's a doctorate in naturopathy and has a master's in marriage and family therapy. After her own health journey and setbacks, she specializes in the genetic analysis, functional naturopathy and emotional wellness for those experiencing MCAS. She's passionate about helping and teaching others to do the same. Welcome to FX Medicine, Beth, and thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me on, and I think this will really be a a significant game changer for some practitioners because, as we know, pre-COVID population studies of mast cell activation syndrome showed it was affecting up to 17% of the general population. We suspect it's much higher because of the trigger, mast cell trigger that COVID is higher today. Mm. Oh, I'm excited to get into that. So I'm going to start with a question I'm assuming you get asked a lot, which is what is MCAS and how does it present and also why you became so interested in this space? Sure. So we'll start with what is MCAS? So mast cell activation syndrome, it's an immune dysregulation and it's defined as multi-systemic, meaning it affects more than one system, and it can present with or without allergy, and it can present with or without anaphylaxis, and with or without hypersensitivity. There are a myriad of different kinds of symptoms that people can experience, and this comes down to which mast cells in the body's are dysregulated, which receptors are affected, and which mediators are being over-released. So we know that the mast cells are in every tissue in our bodies except the retina. And then there are over 200 receptors on the mast cells for everything from various pathogens, whether we're talking about Lyme bacteria, we're talking about Bartonella, or we're talking about Shigella or something like that. For viruses, whether it's COVID or flu or cold virus, Epstein-Barr. For molds, for parasites, there are receptors for chemicals, for hormones, for stress and injury, for cytokine signaling from other immune cells. And we could spend the whole podcast just on those receptors. Yeah. And then with the mediators... People know about histamine, and that's very well known, but there's over a 1,000 mediators. So these include mediators like prostaglandins, interleukins. There's a whole class of different inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines, substance P. And one of the mediator classes I want people to just tuck into the back of their mind because we'll come back to it is that mast cells also release some neurotransmitters and neuropeptides. So there was a continual communication loop with the nervous system, and they actually Mm. reside along every nerve sheath and at every nerve ending. So they're the interface between the nervous system 
and the rest of the body. And that's very important when we get into how do you work with people who are having these kinds of issues, and particularly those with the hypersensitivity. Mm. But since there are so many locations, so many receptors, so many mediators, the types of symptoms that can show up are really based on what permutations of those are occurring for this particular patient and what triggers are happening for them. And mm-hmm. when I think about symptoms, I like to think per system. And there's no way to go through all of them. That would also take the whole the whole podcast <laughs> just to do that. But I'll hit some highlights and then point people to some resources. When we think just systemically, we can have symptoms like chronic fatigue is one of the most common. Uh, chronic pain, muscle pain, joint pain is common. Sensitivities aren't always there, but if somebody has a lot of sensitivities, if they're the person who's holding their breath to try to get down the laundry aisle of the grocery store, or they're struggling with supplements and medications, and most of these things are triggering them, they're having food reactions, it's not a guarantee that it's mass activation syndrome, but it's a good clue to at least dig and find out. Mm. And people can have general inflammation, they can have general swelling, they can have water retention. In the musculoskeletal system, we talked about muscle and joint pain. They can have a bone pain and mast cells are actually made in the bone marrow and then migrate out. There's a relationship with mast activation syndrome and hypermobility of both the joints, uh, but also skin and other connective tissue. Osteoporosis, Mm. osteopenia have been linked. And people won't have all of these symptoms, most likely. They'll have some combination of them. What you're telling us is gives us some clues because we often see patients with food sensitivities or chronic pain or fatigue or, you know, I'm thinking of a couple of patients at the moment that are really sensitive to supplements. So it's, it's a great way to kind of take those top end kind of symptoms and sort of see them as potential clues. Yes. And these are the patients who are going from specialist to specialist to specialist, and nobody can piece together the big picture. So they're these mm. often thought of as these mystery cases. And part of it's because this has been so mystifying with there are thousands of possible presentations that can show up. Mm. You know, if we think about the skin, if that's involved, we're going to see things like itching, flushing, hives. We can see uh, burning, skin burning. We can see slow healing of the skin. Hair loss is actually quite common because of inflammation of the hair follicles and not being able to hold on to the root. Um, And then the autoimmune types of skin conditions like rosacea and psoriasis. You can also see eczema. It's a misinformation out there. It used to be thought that everyone with mast activation syndrome had to have skin symptoms. Now we know mm-hmm. that's not true. And there are people with, with them cast without the skin involvement. But I we just wanted to put that out there for people. With the cardiovascular system, we might have chest pains that aren't heart attack related. We might have a rapid heartbeat or heart palpitations. You see a lot of GI symptoms. And this is very common. Anything from diarrhea or constipation, acid reflux, Trouble swallowing and throat tightness is common. Mouth burning, I see a good bit of. Um, Irritable bowel syndrome and all of the inflammatory bowel issues have been linked with mast cell activation syndrome. So we think about if there's chronic inflammation, there's a mast cell component there somewhere. With the brain and nervous system, brain fog, super common. Trouble with word recall. See a lot of headaches, see anxiety and depression and insomnia. Tinnitus is common. Just ear ringing is one of the most excruciating symptoms if people have that. May get numbness, tingling um, with the respiratory system if that's involved. We get things like wheezing. We can have asthma, shortness of breath. A lot of post nasal drip is common, sinus congestion. Again, people may not have that system involved, so we always have to keep open to which systems are involved here. We can have irritation, redness around the eyes. Reproductive tract can be involved, and particularly things like endometriosis, painful menstruation. 
hormone imbalances, the urinary tract inflammation in the urinary tract, bladder burning and pain is common in both men and women. And then anaphylactic reactions can occur. Not everyone has those. And almost every form of autoimmunity that I've seen, every form I've seen, there may be some that haven't been associated, but I'm pretty confident based on the mechanisms of the immune system that we'll eventually find that every autoimmunity is linked to mast cell activation syndrome. Ehlers-Danlos is closely related and POT, postural orthostatic tachycardia, um, autism spectrum disorders are related, rheumatoid arthritis, Hashimoto's, multiple sclerosis, any of those, if there's autoimmunity or these kind of chronic inflammatory issues, we want to trace back and see, are the mast cells dysregulated? Hmm. I mean, what you've just presented there is just enormous and obviously having like thousands of receptors and nearly every system of the body apart from the retina, you know, being involved. Are we talking about mast cell activation syndrome being the mechanism for the symptomatology or is it a distinct symptom on its own? Like can you have something like an autoimmune disease and not have MCAS being the underlying causation of it? a great question. And I think it traces back to how are we going to define mast cell activation syndrome? And that diagnostic code only became official in 2016. So the diagnostic criteria is still in flux. I think what we could officially say is there will be mast cell dysregulation. And then whether or not it qualifies concretely as mast cell activation syndrome depends on what state we're in and the evolution of that diagnostic criteria, which is still being debated. Uh, mm. But if there's chronic inflammation, there's going to be some mass involvement. And that's what I'm most concerned about. Mm. The diagnostic criteria for my purposes are just too new. And I consult and I don't, I don't diagnose, but I'm looking at getting people back, getting, getting their health and their lives back. I'm going to get to the diagnosis in a second, but I, I really wanted to find out why you became so interested in this space. Yes, this was a journey of my own health. I started developing health issues around age eight. We had moved to an old farmhouse in the country, and I thought it was a great adventure, and it it was. You know, there were really fun aspects of it, but my health started unraveling, and no one knew back then. I mean, this was the early 80s. No one knew about mold toxicity, Barely anyone knew about Lyme disease, and we were bitten by ticks. And when I was a child, I'd be covered head to toe in hives and scratching until it bled. I had a traumatic brain injury when I was nine, and that set off all of this brain inflammation for decades. And I developed severe insomnia and anxiety, dark depression. And I was very academically inclined, though, so I kept pushing academically and pushed way too hard. I really wanted to become a neurologist. I was on track to go to medical school. And my senior year of undergrad, I had burned the candle at both ends. I had gotten scholarship offers and I had to turn them all down because I was so ill at that point, I could hardly get out of bed. Mm -hmm. And it was just devastating. I didn't have a backup plan. That was all I could envision myself doing. And instead of going to become a neurologist, I became a chronically ill patient. And my Mm. health kept cycling downward until by the time I was 28, I was hobbling with a cane. I could barely even walk from excruciating pain. I didn't sleep for four years. I had daily panic attacks. I was itching head to toe. I had severe GI distress daily basis. I'd gotten down to 10 foods that I could tolerate. And I lost my tolerance to medications and any supplements. So even a little sprinkle of curcumin would give me extreme anxiety, flushing. A little bit of quercetin would worsen my insomnia. Now I know about salicylate intolerance, but I didn't understand that then. But Mm. even GABA, just a little sprinkle of GABA would send me out of my skin And I totaled up at one point, I'd seen over 75 practitioners. Nobody knew what to do with me. And I 
exhausted traditional medicine, holistic medicine, functional medicine. We didn't have a word for mast cell activation syndrome back there. And everyone mm-hmm. I saw, the compassionate ones, said, you're the most sensitive person I've ever met. And I, I'm so sorry. I just don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. And the ones that were frightened and didn't know how to handle it told me that I was crazy, that it was in my <laughs> head, that my lab work looked normal, and I got a referral to psychiatry. And somehow I kept going. If, I, if I'm if i nothing else, I'm tenacious. Yeah. And, I, and I kept going. And the last time someone said, I don't know what to do, was the most experienced functional medicine physician at the time I could get to. Well, this was before telemedicine. That did make sense. Yeah. And I sobbed the whole way home and sobbed the whole rest of the day. And I woke up the next morning and said to myself, Beth, what else are you going to do? You can lie here or die, or you can figure this out. And I had the pre-med background. So any moment my brain would start to focus, even if all I could do was read two sentences of a research paper, that's what I would read and try to piece together what it was saying. And it it took me a total of about 20 years to put the pieces together. But I figured out the root triggers. Once I learned about mast cell activation syndrome, then I was off to the races because I had something to focus on. And Mm. it was still in its research phases at that point. Um, But I did. I put it together. I met Dr. Neil Nason, who has influenced me tremendously and is my close mentor, and learned about the root triggers and addressed those. And I... Went back to graduate school later in life and built the practice. And I'm, I just like to share with people some of the wins that I just came back from a trip to go see my husband's grandchildren and I got to play with them all day and I could pick them up and pack them around and I can go hiking these days. I haven't used a cane in years and my brain is fully functional. So it's been a, a huge, huge turnaround. Yeah, I mean, what an inspirational story. I mean, I think it, it it really does give that deep merit when you've actually been the patient yourself. We talk about that quite commonly, but to build yourself up from really the end of the line essentially is what you've just described and back up to being fully functioning, dropped the cane. It's one of those inspirational stories I think all all of us love to hear. So obviously, like you know, MCAS from from the core, you know, or, or the way in which to kind of rebuild a body. So for you, how did you start after finding out that? Like what were the first things that you did to turn to turn that around for yourself? Well, after <laughs> running into a brick wall many, many times because I didn't know what I was doing and it mm. was all experimentation, eventually what started turning things around was, one, getting out of mold exposure. Mm. I didn't even know that I'd been exposed most of my life, even if I had left home, and started working on my nervous system. Mm -hmm. That was what started turning it around so that I could start to tolerate things. And when I began to start supplements again, I started with extreme microdosing. And just to give people a sense of what this means, a lot of times I tell people, you know, you're going to start small with some sprinkles. And then they come back and, you know, I review what they were doing. And I'm like, well, how much did you actually take? And they'll say an eighth of a capsule. I'm like, no, no, no. Because it, it'll backfire on the really sensitive people. Mm. When I say sprinkles, I mean literally the equivalent of like three or four grains of sand. Like yeah. a dusting. <laughs> and I, yeah. I started with just the very first thing. I mean, it might have been a B vitamin because it mm. was so long ago. I don't really remember. But I started single ingredients, and I'm pretty sure I started with B vitamins because herbs I couldn't handle at the time, probably because of social intolerance yeah. and the uh, extreme micro load that I had. But anything that could handle, I remember using B2. Now, it's not where I would start people today, but I would open the capsule, put this little dusting in water, and just do that for two months. And then I would oh, start with the months. next thing I thought I could layer in, like B1. I Mm. put the tiniest little dusting of B1 in with the B2. And over about four or five years, I built myself up to where I could do these little sprinkles of, I had about 30 different things, and I'd make myself this little sludge every day. 
twice a day, and I could get that down. Now we have a whole method and a whole system of how to guide people through. Mm. And I call it the this first step, the stabilization phase. So we really start with stabilizing the nervous system, particularly the limbic and the vagal nerve. And we stabilize the mast cells. So just going to stop you there, Beth. When you say stabilize the nervous system, because there's obviously so many things that can support that. What do you do to stabilize the nervous system? Like how would you start with that? Yeah. So I want to reach back towards the podcast you had on psychoneuroimmunology. Mm. And I was so excited to see that. That's what I did my master's research in. That's what I did my postgrad in too. It's my it's my passion. Oh, great. Well, we're going to mm. have fun here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So for people who aren't as familiar with this or they haven't listened to that podcast yet, I really want to encourage them to listen to that because it's essential in really, really understanding the mast cells and how they function. So to go back to how they line every nerve sheath and their every nerve ending, and I talked about how mast cells release neurotransmitters and neuropeptides. They also have receptors for neurotransmitters and neuropeptides. There truly is this constant communication feedback. And particularly for people who are not tolerating anything supplement-wise. I get a lot of people can't handle anything orally. Their skin is a mess. They can't do patches or anything topical. And they're not ready for the dosage of an IV. The nervous system is a way that we can enter and calm the mast cells down in an incredible way. And it's for, especially for sensitive people, it's about at least 50% of their healing process. There are two important parts of the nervous system that we focus on, the limbic system and the vagal nerve. And a lot of times people will tell me, well, I'm using the Calm app or Headspace app, or I'm listening to meditations on YouTube, or I'm doing yoga, breathing and meditation. And that's great and definitely continue those. But the limbic system and the vagal nerve have a lot of power involving how the mast cells regulate or dysregulate. And particularly because both of those systems are highly involved in monitoring for safety. And the mast cells are all about monitoring for safety. Mm. And that's how they work in conjunction. And there are mast cells in the limbic system inside the brain. And With the limbic system particularly, it's very important to have a method where we are exercising, going from our fight or flight, anxious state, and the mental ruminating that we all do, and shifting that very deliberately and consciously into a deep state of calm and peace and safety. And there are different ways of doing that, but we have to do it repeatedly. We have to train that, those neural pathways, just like we might train for a marathon where you're going to build up slowly over time and you're going to have a daily practice and you wouldn't just do one day of it and then go run a marathon. You're going to train over time, over several months. And the best programs I've found for that have been Annie Hopper's DNRS or Ashok Gupta's Gupta program, and both are fantastic. And I tell people, look at both of them and see what who you resonate with, whose voice feels safer to you, who mm-hmm. do you feel most relaxed with. And there are a few others. There's one now called the Primal Trust Academy that's come up and another called Direct Your Own Care. But there are not many of these. They're very specific. On the vagal nerve, there are so many modalities that people can use, and we have to hone them for their sensitivities. Some people have a lot of light and sound sensitivities, so they may not be able to use those modalities. So they may have a lot of EMS sensitivities. But it's great as a practitioner to have a whole toolkit to choose from because the more vagal support people do, more different kinds of ones, the faster they can reboot that system from dysregulation back to regulation. Some of the my favorites are Brain Tap, which is an audio program that has different sound modulations in each ear. They have a lot of programs, but they're particular ones for healing and uh, relaxation. 
and target at the vagal nerve. That's even more effective if people can tolerate the light. There are things like alpha stem. I actually just got to try this last night, and it's a currency mm. you put on, on your earlobes, and it runs a particular frequency, and it's very calming, and it's oriented towards the vagal nerve. Mm. There that are things good. like frequency-specific microcurrent, and that's one you have to do with a practitioner. So when people have a physical location, um, that's a wonderful one to look into getting certified in because then you can bring people into your office and give them those kinds of treatments. Mm. There are other things like vagal acupressure that's helpful. There's another listening program that we use a lot in our clinic called the Safe and Sound Protocol. It was mm. developed um, from Stephen Porges' polyvagal work. And those are just, just a selection of some of the ones that are out there. It's brilliant to, to talk about that psychoneuroimmunology component of the treatment because I think that's often been missed over the treatment programs that we've kind of supported people through and understanding with that significant sensitivity that working with the body rather than working against the body because really muscle activation syndrome, a little bit like autoimmunity, is almost like the body fighting and so rather than joining the fight and, you know, it's that sort of almost philosophical way of, you know, you can't cure anger with anger kind of thing. It's like really working within and sort of coming around and, and really stroking in the body and keeping it safe and creating trust. And that way has a profound shift in our immunity and therefore our overall nervous system health. And so it's fascinating for me for you to actually bring this as, as almost like the first component of your healing Mm -hmm. mechanism when you're dealing with somebody that is in that state of severe sensitivity? It's so critical. And it, we also have a psychologist on staff who's well-versed in this area and mind-body approaches, and she works with emotional support coaching, right? But from an emotional support perspective, also just having that support of Feeling safe with another person and witness, because the reason I share the part of my story that I was told so often I was crazy, because it's so common and it's traumatizing for people and they've mm. heard it many times, unfortunately. And even that being witnessed in that, yes, your symptoms are real in a way that isn't encouraging them to be a victim, but is empowering them to say, yes, your symptoms are real. Yes, you're, you are experiencing this and there are things you can do about it. And to have somebody do that in a way that's compassionate and gentle and then help them feel safe in their bodies again is huge. So this mm -hmm. is, is the whole foundation for moving forward, especially for the hypersensitive people. And while we're talking about safety, bringing in as well, emotional safety, safety within our our relationships, whether it's our family relationships, our friendships, other social relationships, or work. It's amazing how many people with chronic illness are in relationship with somebody in some way that's disordered, and that's also not safe. So I've had times where people have gotten out of mold, they've done all of the stuff, but they, they're not improving, and when we start digging, we start to realize oh, you're being emotionally abused on a regular basis. Mm. So I just want to open the, some of these pieces for practitioners dealing with the, the patients who were like I was. And there's all of these components to it. And if we start thinking outside of the box, outside of just, well, give them some quercetin or give them an H1 blocker or something like this, what are the actual triggers going on underneath and how do we help them navigate it? Because this is it's a lot of work to do what we're doing with what we're all doing with these really chronically ill patients. And it's interesting what you say too, because we're talking about emotional safety, you know, maybe in relationships, making maybe in the workplace, maybe in intimate partner relationships, but also you alluded to mold. So sometimes when the environment is unsafe as well, like you were nine years old, eight years old when you moved into a mouldy environment. And and I think, you know, in my experience with some patients that have had an external parasite or um, bacteria or virus really impact their body over a long period of time, how 
unsafe they feel and how angry they feel Mm -hmm. at that external um, stressor. And I just think that, you know, it's often with muscle activation syndrome, you can see these multitude of causation factors. And so what you're teaching us is to look at the whole and by piecing together and accepting every single part of the pie and knowing kind of when to start and when to move is really the art of the practitioner and the patient relationship. That's absolutely it, yeah. So I want to take you back to a few more practicalities because I know that, you know, you have an expertise in analysing genetics and genetic sensitivity and you find that a really powerful, important part of your practice. Tell me about some of the testing that you consider or that you find really helpful in which to confirm or embellish your thinking as a practitioner. First, I want to frame the genetics in terms of thinking about it as epigenetics. And when we have these underlying triggers that affect our genetic expression, like mycotoxins, like Lyme or these other co-infections or metals, chemical toxins, stressors, all of these affect our genetic expression. The way I look at the genetics is that we'll have these weak points that once the genetic expression is affected, will be highlighted. But also remembering that when the triggers are removed, it's amazing how the genetic expression can correct itself. And often these genetic variants are not a big deal. Hmm. And just a case in point, I'll use myself again. I have a significant genetic variants on the heme pathway and had acute intermittent porphyria when I was really ill as well. And that those attacks happened repeatedly until I got out of the mold exposure and got partway down the detoxification and got some of this out and the, the Lyme handled and the co-infections handled. The only time I have any trouble with that pathway now is if I'm at elevation and low oxygen can be a trigger. And I have, I, I just increased my carbs slightly and I'm fine for somebody mm-hmm. who had severe attacks historically. So that's just an example. And I, I see a lot of things turn around for people. The genetic testing that I use, I use Bob Miller's functional genomic analysis. And I find that his software for practitioners is quite comprehensive and he has all kinds of ways of presenting the data and their biochemistry maps in there with the genes laid right in there. It's very powerful. Mm. Some of the SNPs that I look at, some of my top ones are the ones for histamine, the ABP1, AOC1 genes for diamine oxidase, which is different, by the way, than the DAO gene, and that gets mixed up sometimes online. The DAO gene is for diamino oxidase, not diamine oxidase. So for mm. DAO, diamine oxidase, it's AOC1 or ABP1. Uh, the HNMT genes, the um, histamine receptor genes I find really helpful. And the ones, other, some of the others involved in histamine breakdown. So these are going to be the glucuronidation gene, UGT1A1. There's CYP21A2 that has to do with converting progesterone to cortisol. Um, that's muscle stabilizing. Let me... Come back to histamine for a second, though. Yeah, so the yeah. HDC gene is the helpful one, and uh, that one has to do with converting histidine to histamine. MAO genes break down histamine. Acetylation genes, NAT one and two, break down histamine. On the mast cell side, I look at the KIT genes. I like to look at IL six and IL thirteen. Those interleukins. Those are some of the the top ones that I like to touch on. And then anything that's inflammatory can impact. You know, if we have iron dysregulation issues, if we have issues with copper transport to where copper is accumulating, which is really common in this population, we have issues with glutathione. Oh, I want to touch on one other, which is SIRT2, S-I-R-T-2. And... SIRT2 is the signaler, and it signals to inflammasome production. One mm. of the really interesting things about SIRT2 
is that you can modulate that with resveratrol. Mm. You can also modulate it with bicarbonate. And one of my first entry points for really sensitive people is actually if they have low blood pressure, use baking soda. Mm. It's pretty for cheap. For that inflammatory <laughs> modulation. Mm. <laughs> so all of those genetics, I mean, for a, for a new practitioner, that sounds quite complicated, but... Is there particular pathology tests that you can use, but even the standard tests like looking at the full blood examination, looking at uh, zinc and copper levels, looking at urinary and, and liver function tests, is there other pathology tests that can highlight some of these issues? Why don't we talk about the ones that are diagnostics for mast cell activation syndrome and then Sounds I'll talk about perfect. what I find to be most useful. Okay, great. In the current diagnostic criteria, there are 10 markers that are mast cell mediators, and one of the 10 has to be elevated. These are tryptase, somagranin A, prostaglandin D2, plasma histamine, urinary N-methyl histamine or urine histamine, plasma heparin, and then you can also measure prostaglandin D2 and prostaglandin S2, and leukotriene E4 in the urine. The challenge with those is that all of those samples have to be kept chilled until processing, and they have to be cold centrifuge processed, which most labs, at least in the States, don't have. I don't know about Australia. Mm. And most of the time, these tests don't get run correctly. They don't get analyzed or processed correctly. Mm. And Dr. Afrin, who's one of our leaders in this field, he believes that if it's processed correctly, one of those is going to be elevated. One of the questions I keep coming back to is if there's over a thousand mediators and we only have 10 we can measure, how do we know they have an issue with one of those 10 and not the 990 plus others? Mm. (laughs) So I don't know the answer to that. I don't usually ask people to run those other than sometimes it's nice to see the plasma histamine and the N-methyl histamine. But I do ask people to get CBCs and CMPs every six months. And this is because we deal with so much toxicity and so much tick-borne infections and need to track these. Mm. I look at, in the CBC, the eosinophil percentage. So that's and what. So over f- for, I was just going to say, Beth, we use the term FBE for CBC. So just for clarification, but go on. Okay, thank you. So I look at the eosinophil percentage. The eosinophils. There's two other cells besides mast cells that make histamine: eosinophils and basophils. Mm. If those eosinophils are over two percent, then that can be a good case for using catodafin or rupatidine. And those are both anti-eosinophilic as well as have other mast cell stabilizing properties. So that's one for people to keep an eye on. And then why are the eosinophils elevated? With the CMP, is that the right term mm. for Australia? Oh, okay. Yeah. UNEs and LFTs. Okay. So with your UNEs and your LFTs, generally I see kidney markers, they in a good range in the population I see. And I can only mm-hmm. speak to that population. But I really watch those liver enzymes because, again, there's so much toxicity in people who are really chronically ill and make sure they're getting liver support if they need it. There's a few other blood tests I ask people to get routinely. Vitamin D, 25-OH. Vitamin D is mast cell stabilizing. Mm. And In the mast cell population, we want that. Now we're going to get into trouble with units of measurement. But (laughs) in the units of measurement we use here, we want it between 60 and 100. I think it's the same. Then, okay, then the iron markers. I always look beyond ferritin because ferritin Mm. is only showing us about 10% of our iron stores and can also be a marker for inflammation. Mm-hmm. Just because ferritin is low, I've seen a ferritin at six or seven, and the red blood cells were fine. So I always going to look at those red blood cell markers to see if they're trending low, and then 
also look at your total iron, your iron binding capacity, the percent iron saturation transferrin. Mm. And it's not uncommon to see people dealing with mold toxicity and tick-borne infections and mast cell activation syndrome to tip into true iron deficient anemia. This is why you really want to make sure because if their iron is fine and their red blood cells are fine, but their ferritin is three or four, that may be high, high inflammation. And if you give that person iron, that iron will be inflammatory and can worsen the inflammation state. But if their red blood cell markers are low, and we're talking about their hemoglobin, their hematocrit, MCH, those markers, Mm -hmm. then if they don't get the iron, they're going to be in trouble. And our immune cells rely on iron to function properly. So that's another pearl I can share with people. So looking at those markers, I mean, if we identify a very sensitive patient, you know, and whether they're expressing that through their nervous system, through their immune system, through chronic pain pathways, fatigue, etc., and then going about and using things like psychoneuroimmunological tools, mind-body medicine essentially, so vagal tone stimulation or support and limbic system support and and overall, I guess, empathy from a practitioner to, to know that to go slow is really important, to look at all of the underlying principles of health and well-being. So the healthier the body, the more able that the mast cells can stabilise and looking at either chronic infections such as mold or chronic Lyme or or other kind of stealth-like infections is that way of kind of very slowly supporting the body back to health and well-being all the while using continually mind-body medicine techniques to reinvigorate really and and re-energise the body that has often been unwell for quite a long time. I'd love to share just the overall method we use for sensitive people in a nutshell. It's very brief. And and this isn't what everyone needs. And if people aren't sensitive, there's many ways. I'm not saying this is the only way. I just want to offer Mm. this way of thinking as a possibility for people. The way we move people through is that we started with before the stabilization phase where we stabilize the nervous system and the mast cells. And we remove the triggers. And we do that before we ever start detoxing. Because the people that we see are the ones that keep falling through the cracks. And they're they're failing the regular protocols. They're failing the detox protocols. Nothing's working. They can't handle glutathione. They're struggling with binders. And then we'll do what we can to support sleep, to support cortisol and their sex hormones and thyroid, knowing that that's a moving target while you're getting the triggers addressed. Then while we're doing that, we're assessing what our root triggers are so that we can put together a plan for the order of operations. And it's the order of operations, these really sensitive people that make a difference for them. Mm -hmm. So when there's mold toxicity, which we almost always see in, in this population that we're working with, we start with the mold because it's so neurotoxic disruptive to the immune system, it's almost impossible with a large level of mold illness and mold toxins and colonization to get rid of SIBO or to clear tick-borne infections or Epstein-Barr, these other things, parasites even, when the mold is still there. So we go through a really gentle detox with them, and it takes longer than it does most people, but it's better to take longer and they can actually get through then they only may get a couple months and they crash. Then we'll move on to the tick-borne layer. And usually once those two layers are addressed, most of the people, at least in our practice, start to clear up steam bar and parasites on their own. Um, not exclusively, but most of them. And then when we get to the other side of that, we can start to rebuild things like the gut lining, the bone health, if there's been issues with osteopenia. Now they can actually make headway. They can rebuild their connective tissue. I see earlier stainless, but not the genetic kind, but the hypermobility form. I see it reverse quite a bit. It reversed for me and I don't have signs of it at all anymore. Mm-hmm. And then we just optimize and we do that genetic optimization and get them on a wellness plan. That may take two years on the short end to five years 
to six years if it's a really complex case, but it's way shorter than 20 years. <laughs> and people usually, 95% of people will feel better and better as they go through. So yeah, just want to give right. that order of operations as an option for these sensitive people are so challenging. Mm. That's such a good point. And I think too, I mean, hope is really important and progress is really important as well. So if somebody is getting better all the time, then they can maintain that motivation as well. So Beth, such a wealth of knowledge. Is there any go-to resources or websites or courses if people are really interested in this, they can help themselves navigate this space better? Yes, I'd love to share. We Our website is mass, M-A-S-T as in Tom, D-E-L-L. 360, so masscell360.com. We have so many resources on there. We have a lot of practitioners who come. It's written for a lay audience, but I try to put the little pearls in there for the practitioners. Great. And then we do have three courses. Many practitioners have taken them. There's the uh, nervous system course, all about these different modalities and how to choose. And a lot of practitioners have used that to learn how to walk their clients through picking these different types of modalities and put a program together. Mm -hmm. There's a supplement course, the top eight mass health supporting supplements. And then a, a real flagship course that practitioners love is the MC360. That's the name of the method, MC360 Precision Mold Masterclass. And it starts mm. from the very beginning. When somebody comes in, where do you start with them? How do you walk through? And there's all of these courses have the research in them as well. So I go over the studies and you get all the citations. But in the advanced one, it takes them through the entire mold detox for a sensitive person with mast cell issues. How do you get their mast cell stabilized so they can detox, the order of the detox? A lot of troubleshooting to handle things like stubborn constipation other types of digestive issues, pregnancy and breastfeeding. And there are three case studies that I go through their entire protocol from start to finish and uh, what, what really got them well. Um, three people had quite significant illness and sensitivities. Beth, thank you so much for being with us today to discuss all things MCAS. It's certainly a, a complicated uh, presenting issue, but the way that you shine that light on on how we can walk through those complexities over a long period of time and the basic principles you have given us so many tools to, to work with and helped in our understanding. And, and hopefully we can pass that on to many more patients in Australia and, and this side of the world. So I'm really grateful for you to be here sharing with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy we can partner to help more people get this out to those people that are suffering. Thanks everyone for listening today. Don't forget that you can find all the show notes, transcripts and other resources from today's episode on the FX Medicine website. I'm Dr. Michelle Woolhouse and thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. This podcast is intended as healthcare practitioner education only, and it is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Did you know Bioceuticals has a clinic-only range developed for exclusive use by clinicians? This product range offers complex formulas, higher doses, and specific ingredients for specialised cases. Bioceuticals Clinical infuses quality, credibility, innovation and professionalism into an exclusive product range that meets the needs and demands of private clinicians. Visit bioceuticals.com.au to learn more.